Hello, welcome back to the maintenance course. Today we are on the third lecture and we are going to discuss the maintenance of non-repairable systems. Today we have a busy agenda with six topics to cover and the first one that I would like to start is of course by the introduction to non-repairable analysis. Non-repairable analysis is essentially a, meta a set of methodologies and concepts that allows us to assess the reliability of a non-repairable system, a system that only has one lifetime and one time to failure. It is supported by probability theory and examples of methodologies are, for example, probability distributions such as the, log the normal, log normal, and so on. And it also covers concepts such as the bathtub curve. It is different from the methodologies that we have studied so far, such as the FMEA, or the reliability block diagram or others. Throughout this video, uh, I'm going to talk extensively about non-repairable systems and I need to make four assumptions. The first one is that a non-repairable system is a system where you observe a single time to failure, a single failure. Uh, and the time between the beginning of the lifetime of the equipment and that failure, we are going to call it the time to failure. The second assumption has to do with the fact that the systems that we are going to monitor, that we are going to examine, have uh, independence between them. So the behavior of one, the failure of one, is not dependent on the behavior and the failure of the other. The third assumption has to do with the fact that the system should be identical, and identical in terms both of design and operating conditions. And if they are so, it is much easier to predict their behavior because we can extrapolate the behavior of a set of systems to uh, other sets of systems. The fourth assumption has to do with reproducibility. The experiment of monitoring the lifetimes of different equipment should be always reproducible. But why is it important? Why is it relevant? And what's the major goal of non-repairable analysis? Well, the idea is that you will monitor equipment, several equipment, more than one, and you will be able to know their lifetimes, the, the time until the first failure. And using that information and using probability theory in non-repairable analysis, we are able to define when to perform the maintenance of future uh, systems. And this is important because for scheduled maintenance, we need to set hard time events and we need to know, based on the past, how to set those events. Now let us go to the section where we will discuss the, what is the probability system and the elements involved. And I would like to start by the history of probability theory, which fundamentally invented the concept of probability system. And I would like to start by, by talking about a game. Uh, we all like games. Uh, and this game is the game of points. It lasts for several rounds. And at each round, uh, one of the two players uh, receives one point or not uh, given uh, equal probability of getting the point. In the end, who gets more points wins the game. It's actually a very simple game, but it's a game that intrigued Blaise Pascal in the 17th century. One of his friends uh, described to him the game, and he started uh, almost immediately thinking about the probabilities involved. And from this formal development uh, was the, the field of probability theory was uh, born. Other contributors to the field of probability theory were several well-known mathematicians like Fermat, Bernoulli, or Gauss. Uh, nowadays, probability theory is a, a solid uh, field, and it's applicable to many other fields, such as, for instance, the maintenance or general engineering. The goals are always uh, the same, typically, to handle uncertainty, to handle the probability of something that we don't know, to analyze past data, to project our information uh, into the future, and to make useful predictions. 
The fundamental concept of probability theory is the probability system. And what is the probability system? It basically describes, it encapsulates all the information that we can have about the random experiment. And it involves defining the sample space, the space of events, and also, very importantly, the probability function. Random experiment or experiment is a term that we use uh, very often in probability theory. And what does it mean? Well, an experiment is a process which has to be repeated and controlled. It has to have these two properties in order to be a random experiment. And it's a process in which we observe something uncertain, something that involves uh, something unknown, something that we need to observe first before we actually know the outcome. And examples of experiments are the classical example of the dice, rolling a dice and seeing what you get in terms of the face of sides of the dice, or taking a card from a card deck, or in maintenance to investigate the lifetime, how long a system will last. An experiment, a random experiment, involves the notion of trial. And trial, for example, in the case of the dice, is every time that you roll the dice. So it is a performance, a repetition, or in other words, uh, a realization of a random experiment. In our experiment of analyzing the lifetime of an equipment, such as, for instance, an engine, uh, a trial is every time we analyze the lifetime of a different engine. So in this case, in this picture, we have N trials. Importantly, a random experiment is a controlled process, like we said. And why? Because it respects three properties. Some of them we have already uh, discussed. The first property has to do with reproducibility. So I need to be able to do a trial in the future in the same conditions as I did in the past. Second property has to do with the independence of trials. So all the trials that I make need to be independent. They cannot affect each other in terms of outcomes. And even if the experiment is always uncertain, we need to be sure that there are rules governing uh, the probabilities and the behavior that we are observing. So, in other words, the, the laws governing the probabilities of tomorrow will be the same as of today. When we define a probability system, we need to define, of a random experiment, we need to define the sample space. And the sample space, which is also called possibility space or outcome space, is the set of all possible outcomes or possibilities of having a certain outcome. And giving you ex an example uh, of a dice, uh, the sample space of rolling a dice has six outcomes, because, it's, because the dice has six sides. And each outcome is an elementary, we call an elementary event. So far, I have been talking about discrete sample spaces. Uh, sample spaces that have a finite number of elements and that are easily uh, depicted in a diagram. But what if my sample space is continuous? What if it's an interval of numbers, a spectrum of numbers? In the example of the maintenance engine, uh, the set of all possibilities of lifetimes of the equipment uh, is the set of real numbers, positives, real numbers. In formal terms, the sample space can be defined as the omega, where uh, the omega is the set of all w's, and the w is an elementary event. To further understand the concept of sample space, let me give you a, a brief example about a bottle of candy. So imagine you have a bottle of candy. Each candy is what? Each candy is an outcome, something that we can take out from the bottle and see which candy we got. It's an elementary event. 
but the, the bottle of the set of all candies is the sample space. Another concept that is important to define for probability systems is the concept of event. And an event is also a set, but it's a set within the sample space. So it's a subset. And the events can be elementary or they can just be events with more than one element. When we are talking about continuous sample spaces, defining events can be a little bit different. Such as, for instance, in the case of the engine, I could define the event from 1 to 2.5, meaning that I'm interested in all the time to failures between 1 and 2.5 years. The last concept of a probability system that is important to discuss is the concept of probability. And a probability is always associated with an event. So it's essentially the likelihood that that event might happen in the future. And essentially probability theory tries to come up with methods of, to calculate the probabilities of different events. And I talked about events and I talked about probabilities and who gives the translation, who maps one to the other. Well, that's the concept of probability function. It is a mathematical function that calculates the likelihood of events in a scale from 0 to 1 in the context of an experiment, of a random experiment. In most uh, countries we have uh, some television shows that have a game that is called the Wheel of Fortune. And these games are, interested, are interesting because they involve the concept of probabilities. So let's observe a possible wheel of fortune. So you have here on the left the wheel of fortune and we can see that we have three outcomes, three elementary events, which is the one, the two or the three. And the sample space is going to be uh, the one, the two and the three, a set with the three outcomes. From there, we can start to define our events. The first event that we must not forget is the empty set. It always, uh, it always exists in any kind of experiment, and sometimes we forget about it. But it has a probability of zero of happening. And then we have the elementary events that in this case have uh, different probabilities according to the outcome. We have the remaining events, and an event that is very important, that is the sample space. Because as you can remember, uh, the sample space is also an event, also a set. And then we have the probability function, which is these uh, red arrows that uh, make the translation between the events and the probability space. So for instance, the probability of the sample space, it's going to be equal to 1. And this is always the case, as we will see. A small parenthesis. If you are dealing with probabilities, be aware of the following axioms. The non-negativity that states that the probability of any event has to be a positive number. The normalization axiom that says that the probability of the sample space is 1 and the additive axiom, which says that for any collection of mutually exclusive events that do not share elements, the probability of the union of such events equals to the sum of the individual probabilities of the events. In summary, we have the concept of probability system that is a mathematical framework, also called probability space or probability model, and it defines, it describes an experiment. So it describes the sample space, the omega, the f, the set of all possible events, and the probability function. Let us go now to the third section about random variables and distributions. And the first topic that I would like to start to talk is the random variable. And the random variable is sometimes a uh, 
a concept that is not straightforward and one of the misconceptions is that it is a variable because of the name. But it's not a variable, it's in fact a mathematical function. And this matic mathematical function makes a mapping, a mapping from the outcomes of the random experiment to numerical values. Why do we need to give a, a number to the outcomes? Well, because sometimes the outcomes do not come as numbers. So, for example, if we're dealing with categorical data, we do not have numbers, we have concepts, such as, for instance, if I'm dealing with fruit, I can be dealing with a banana or a pineapple or a strawberry. And in those cases, I need to assign numbers to my outcomes in order to be able to handle them mathematically. But you may still ask, why do we need random variables? Why don't we just live with the outcomes? Well, um, it's a kind of a formalism that mathematicians invented and that we have to respect to a certain extent. And random variables are like the nouns of probability theory. We need them when we are talking about uh, abstract outcomes. And even though in most cases we deal with numbers, we still need to apply the concept of random variables to all our experiments. There are two types of random variables, the discrete and the continuous, uh, and they depend on the sample space. So if the range of the sample space is countable or finite, we have a discrete random variable. If in turn the range of the, the sample space is measurable, so we have infinite possibilities, we are in the presence of a continuous random variable. So how all of this connects to the probabilities? So imagine that we have an event. An event is a set of elementary events, the, the little w's. And if we apply the random variable to a w, we're going to get a, a small x. And that small x is the noun or the name of the w. So we can typically define the probabilities of events, but we can also calculate the probability of the random variable being equal to x, which is similar to saying the probability of the event e. So essentially, we, related to probabilities, we have two concepts. The concept of probability function that comes from the elementary events to the probability space. And we have the concept of probability distribution function, which makes a long turn to get to the same place. And what happens? You go from the random variable, you go to the values of the random variable, and you connect them to the probabilities. And so, the domain of a probability distribution function is the values of the random variable, while the domain of the probability function are the outcomes themselves. So they depart from different uh, places, but they go to the same actual place. There are several different ways to represent the probability distribution function. One such way is using a probability mass function, but this only works for discrete random variables. In that case, for a discrete random variable that is defined in a given probability system, we can say that the probability mass function equals the probability that the random variable associated with the probability system equals to x. This is very important because right away we can see that the probability mass function gives us probabilities of elements in the sample space. But to be a probability mass function, the f of x has to respect certain conditions, such as the f of x has to be a positive uh, number or zero, and this comes from the probabilities because the f of x is a probability uh, by definition. And then we have another condition, which is that the sum of the f of x's has to be equal to 1. This is uh, more or less uh, straightforward, because it says that the sum of the probabilities of elements in the sample space has to be equal to 1, which, of course, it comes from the axioms of the probability.
Let us see this better with an example. So imagine that you have a dice with 10 sides uh, from 0 to 9. You can see that in the probability max function you put the outcomes uh, or the names of the random variable associated to the outcomes as you wish. Uh, you put them in the x-axis and then in the y-axis you can see the probability of that outcome occurring. If you sum all those probabilities, all those little dots, you will get the value of 1 because you are covering the sample space essentially. Now imagine that your dice, your 10-sided dice, is loaded, so there is not an unequal probability for each side. In this case you can have uh, an, a, di a probability mass function as the one illustrated in the picture. But the important thing is that if you add up the probabilities they will still equal to 1. Importantly and in summary the probability mass function also called the PMF is a function and it only applies to discrete random variables and it's essentially the probability that x equals to a certain outcome to a certain value. There is an alternative representation for the probability distribution function for continuous random variables. It only applies to continuous random variables. That is the probability density function. And if you notice the two, the probability distribution function, the prob in the probability density function, they have the same letters, the same initial letters. So to distinguish the two acronyms, we use one in lowercase, the probability density function, and the other in uppercase. If it is easy to go from the probability mass function to the probabilities, that is not as easy as in the case of the probability density function. Because the probability density function represents the density of the probability, to get to the probability we need to integrate the function within a given interval. And the function has to meet certain conditions. The density uh, in a given x has to be a positive number or zero. And the integral of the density function in the sample space has to be equal to 1. This is because if you take the, the total area under the curve, uh, you're taking the probability of the total sample space, which has to be given to 1. Let me give you an example to clarify the definition of probability density function. So I have here the probability density function of the random variable height of students at a certain university. And we can see more or less where most of the density of probability lies, which is around the 186. Uh, and we can also uh, investigate the probability in an interval of, for instance, the students have a height between 185 and 186. It is always possible to get probabilities, but always in an interval, and it's always the area under the curve. The values of the curve, per se, does not mean much. It is important to note that um, the probability density function can have many different shapes. And usually a certain type of shape uh, is associated to a name, such as, for instance, the normal distribution, which has almost always the shape of a bell curve, or the log normal, or the exponential. And we also have some other functions like the variable which are more flexible and that allows us by changing the parameters of the function, of the probability density function, to, uh, to represent different, different shapes. And importantly the variable, it can represent the normal, the log normal and the exponential just by changing a single parameter which is the beta. And this is going to be very useful, as we will see. In summary, the probability density function is a mathematical function. It only applies to continuous random variables whose sample space goes in the domain of the function. And the probability of being in an interval is the integral, the area under the curve.
Another representation of the probability distribution function is the cumulative distribution function, and it's an alternative representation to, for example, to the probability density function. It can also be used as an alternative to the probability mass function, but it's useful, it's usually more useful uh, as an alternative to the probability density function. Why? Because it is essentially the probability. So every time that you're looking at the cumulative distribution function values, you are looking at probabilities that the random variable is less or equal to that certain value. Uh, so the function has to be monotically increasing and it ranges from 0 to 1 because of course it is a probability and the probability ranges from 0 to 1. In the case of discrete random variables we can have the probability mass function but we can also have the cumulative distribution function. And how do we calculate the cumulative distribution function? Well, essentially, we go to each, uh, we accumulate the probabilities at that time. So for one, we will have a probability of 0 0.33, and then we'll have 0 0.66 at two, and then finally at three, the final uh, outcome of the sample space, we have a probability of one. In the case of continuous random variables, we represent the probabilities that the random variable is equal or less than a given value. So we have to look at the probability density function, pick a number, for example 4, calculate the area under the curve to the left, and that is the value of the cumulative distribution function. It is now time to talk about summary measures. Summary measures are not graphical measures. They summarize the distribution in one or in a set of numbers. And sometimes they are useful because they give us numbers to work with. And I will start by the expected value. The expected value is a measure of central tendency that allows us to know where most of the data lies. It's like the average or the mean. But in probability theory, we can calculate them resorting to probabilities. And essentially, there's two ways to calculate it. Uh, the ones that are shown here, according to if you're handling a discrete random variable or a continuous one. The variance is another measure of importance uh, that describes the dispersion, the spread of the data around the, the measure of central tendency around the expected value. So you can calculate it using this formula and if you want to calculate the standard deviation you just have to take the, the square root of the variance and if you simplify the, the formula you get to the last one. Sometimes it is easier to calculate the variance by the first formula, sometimes by the last formula. And with this code, I finish, I complete this section, and now we will start to see how to apply these concepts to reliability theory to predict the behavior of non-repairable systems. And in reliability theory, uh, we continue to work with the concept of probability systems. So we have to define the several elements that constitute a prob the probability system here. So the random variable is the time to failure, the time since the beginning of operation of one equip equipment until the first failure, the TTF. And the random experiment is essentially to examine the TTF of a group of equipments. In that case, uh, the outcome, the concept of elementary event or outcome is a specific value that we might observe uh, of the time to failure. Because we are going to observe time to failures, the random variable is continuous, which means that the probability distribution has to be represented by a probability density function. And of course it can also be represented by other means, but usually we use the probability density function. 
There are many ways to represent the probability distribution function in reliability theory, such as, for instance, with the failure function, the reliability function, the hazard function. These are names that we give in reliability theory to functions that some of them we already know from probability theory. But anyway, one of the fundamental functions is the probability density function. Uh, and this is exactly the same uh, as in probability theory, but it's applied to the random variable time to failure. In reliability theory, we are often interested in the probability that the system will fail uh, from the beginning of life until a given x, until a given specific time. And this is as if you remember the cumulative distribution function that gives you this. And for that reason, we call it failure function, but we could call it also cumulative distribution function. The failure function respects a series of properties, namely that it is the integral to the left of the probability density function, a property that we already knew. And the second property is that it starts at zero. And this is not uh, a property of the cumulative distribution function. Because in the cumulative distribution function, the random variable can uh, possibly assume negative values, which doesn't happen in our case, because the time to failure is always positive. The third property is that it has to do with the time to failure, and the fourth property is that it represents the likelihood that the equipment will fail until a given time since the beginning of its operation until a given time. The formula to calculate it is given uh, below. So let me discuss three properties of the failure function. Here you see a probability density function and you can uh, calculate the area under the curve from 0 to 3 and that will be the value of the failure function at the value 3. So there is a connection between the failure function and the probability density function. Then we have here another example of how to calculate the failure function at 5, and it's the area uh, to the left under the curve of the probability density function, once again. And so there is a, uh, this strong connection between the PDF and the, pro and the failure function. And importantly, the failure function will always start at zero because it will start uh, when the probability is zero. And then it will grow in different ways according to the way that the probability, the probability density function is. And then it will uh, stop at one because 1 is the maximum probability that will be reached at the end of the sample space. To summarize our uh, class, let us see three properties. The first one is that the total area under the probability density function curve has to be equal to 1, and this follows from the axiom of normalization. The second property has to do with how we relate the probability density function and the, um, the failure function. And we go from one to the other by derivating or by integrating. Importantly, the third property has to do with uh, finding if a TTF, a time to failure, falls within an interval. So imagine that I'm not interested in knowing if the time to failure is between zero and 5, but between 2 and 5. Uh, in that case, I, I need to subtract the failure uh, function at those values, or to make the integral of the probability density function uh, in, in those extremes. An important concept in reliability theory is the concept of percentile life and we often use it to set the maintenance events. So, uh, for example, imagine that I want to set a hard time event, but I don't care so much about losing 10% of my 
uh, of my equipment and failing before of that date. Then I need to search for the percentile life 10. Why? Because the percentile life is the specific point in time. It will tell us where to set the maintenance event at which uh, the 10 percentage of items or 90 percent or whatever percent are expected to fail. There is another uh, measure uh, that allows us to represent the probability distribution function, that is the reliability function. And it is uh, deeply connected to the concept of failure function because one is the opposite of the other. So the failure function is the probability that the equipment will fail in a given interval from 0 to x, while the reliability function is the likelihood that the equipment will survive in that same interval, which means that the time to failure will go beyond the x. So if the time to failure will go beyond the x, then we have to calculate it from the probability density function by integrating it from x to infinity. Because of the axiom of the normalization and because we know that the total area under the curve equals to 1 for the same x, we can know that adding the reliability function to the failure function will add up to 1. In summary, the reliability or the survival function can be defined as 1 minus the failure function where the reliability function can be defined in two ways, either that it is the probability that the item will not fail in 0 to x, or the probability that the item will survive at least to time x. In order to calculate the expected time to failure, we have to use the formula for the continuous random variables. But in that case, uh, you can also integrate from 0 to infinity the reliability function and you will get also the expected value. Which formula you decide to use depends on the information that you have um, and, and the context of the problem. So we have now studied two functions of great usefulness which are the failure function and the reliability function. But what if I want to know the likelihood that the system will fail now? That the system was functioning so far and now it failed in, the exact, in this exact moment. How to express this mathematically? Well, we can do it with the hazard function and since I used the, the word given, given that I have survived so far as an equipment, I am talking about conditional probability. So I'm going to set a very small interval, so I'm going to use the limit for that, and I'm going to uh, make my time to failure in between x and x plus uh, uh, that tiny interval of time. And given that the time to failure is larger than x, so it has survived so far, I'm going to calculate that probability. So this is the limit of a conditional probability, and this is what we called the hazard function. This table shows that it is uh, possible to go from one function to the other in reliability theory and in probability theory also. So as an example, if you have the probability density function, you can integrate the function from 0 to x and you get f of x. In contrast, if you have the failure function at x, you can uh, take the derivative of the function and you get the probability density function. So all of these correspondences are uh, important. So far we have discussed the probability density function and other functions in general but we have not discussed the actual shape that the, the probability density function should have to help us more or less in reliability theory, to be more or less adequate for reliability theory. So today we are going to discuss the exponential, the normal and the log normal distributions as a means to model the lifetime of certain equipment.
The first distribution that I would like to discuss is the log normal. The log normal is characterized by two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation, uh, and according to how you set these parameters, you have a different shape, more or less the same, but a different shape of probability density function. But most importantly, uh, you will have a hazard function that is decreasing after some point. And for that reason, you can use the hazard function to model burn-in periods. And what are burn-in periods? Well, it's periods of, uh, of the lifetime of the equipment in which there is more risk of failing uh, at one moment and less risk of failure later uh, in, the, in the lifetime of the equipment. And usually this happens at the beginning of the life of the equipment. And that is why we call it the infant mortality region, because a lot of equipment that is new actually fails immediately after being put into operation. There are several ways to counteract, uh, or at least to minimize this risk, this high risk at the beginning of the life of the equipment which is uh, to install a burning testing period where you don't uh, send uh, the equipment immediately to the client, but you let it operate for a certain period of time. Most of these errors are due to the design or to manufacturing, uh, and uh, the log normal is very useful to, to model this, this type of failures. If the log normal distribution is good to model the lifetime of equipment when they are in burning periods, the exponential distribution is useful for when there are random failures and when the risk is always the same. So if you look at here at the hazards function, the, regardless of the lambda that you select of the parameter lambda of the distribution, you have a, a constant hazard function. And this is useful because it means that the risk of failing, uh, the conditional probability of failing at that moment, is always the same. Uh, the random failure period is a region that usually uh, occurs after the infant mortality period. Uh, and the, the failures occur more or less randomly caused by, for instance, overstressed, not necessarily by, by the age of the equipment. And finally, we have the normal distribution, which is defined also by two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, and that always has the shape of a bell curve and that has, importantly, uh, an increasing hazard function, meaning that you have less risk uh, at one point and then increasingly more risk of failing if you're using the normal distribution to model the time to failure. If you do so, uh, you can model periods of wear out, of wear out failures. And we call it this also the increasing hazard region and it, this region typically happens after a period of random failures, uh, where erosion, corrosion, and fatigue, or uh, in other words, accumulated degradation, dictate uh, the behavior of the equipments during this region. Um, there is no concept of random failures here, but failures caused by aging, by, by time. And in that case, uh, the normal distribution is useful because it can model the increasing hazard. We are now in section 6, uh, so we will discuss finally <laughs> the concept of bathtub curve and Weibull distribution, some of the most interesting concepts of today's lesson. And can you guess what is the bathtub curve? Well, we have already talked about it when we said that there was a burning period, a random failures and wear out failures. If you draw those lines and connect them together, over time you'll get a bathtub curve. That's why it's called a uh, bathtub curve. Uh, and essentially this represents the typical lifetime of a series of families of equipment of, of any kind, really, because uh, 
The reliability theory postulates that the Batlab curve is applicable to most systems. We have seen how to model the, the lifetime of an equipment that follows a Batlab curve uh, using the log normal, the normal, and the exponential distribution. But wouldn't it be great if we had just a single distribution that could model the three periods uh, just by different configurations? Well, it is possible, and it's called the Weibull distribution. Uh, it has this, uh, this equation here. So it has the probability density function has uh, three parameters. So the beta, the, the scale, and the location. Uh, and we will see how changing these parameters will uh, provide us with a different shape that resembles either a normal or a log normal or an exponential function. Uh, the parameter shape has its name because if you change it, uh, it, it changes the, the form or the shape of the probability density function. And it changes drastically. I say this because according to the shape, if it's between 0 and 1, or if it's 1, or if it's larger than 1, you will have uh, a different hazard function that can model a different period of the bathtub curve. So if you have a beta, for example, 0 0.5, between 0 and 1, you are in a period of infant mortality. If you have a beta of 1, you have a constant hazard function, which gives you usage life. And if you have a beta, for example, of 2 or 3 or anything larger than 1, you are in a wear out period. The scale, the scale parameter doesn't change the shape of the distribution. It stays the same in terms of probability density function and the other remaining uh, functions. The only thing that changes is the scale uh, in the sample space domain. So now let us plug in the, the scale parameter at the filler function and see what can we get. And by simplifying the equation, we get to the number 0 0.632. And this means that 63.2% of the equipment will have failed at the parameter scale. That's why this parameter is called the characteristic life. So whenever you're setting the scale parameter, you know that that scale parameter is connected, relates to 63.2% of the equipment failing at that time. I hope that you have had a good lecture, that you have enjoyed the ride, uh, and uh, thank you for watching and see you next video.